Well, it does. Yep, says we're live. Okay. Okay. Is it crooked or is it straight? We're we're there, I believe. Okay. Sure it's not. It keeps telling me to rotate the device. Yeah, then rotate it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now we're gonna have some All righty. Hey, good afternoon, or good morning, or good tomorrow if you're watching from Guam. Uh, Art of Fire Glass Blowing Studio here. We're happy to participate again in the virtual craft festival. And uh, we do our camera work a little bit different here because we have a device we use moving around the room. We can't participate in the regular link that you all use. So if some of you are finding you can't uh, get our participation right away, it's because you gotta go to our, our page, our uh, YouTube channel. And if there are folks still over on the link that are looking for where are those doggone glass blowers, hey, how about telling them we found them on their YouTube channel and that would be the Art of Fire glass blowing. So I see a few of you got here with us, Brian and uh, Malcolm, JP Woodwork. Great, great to have you. All right, good. So, uh, well, we've got uh, the owner here, Foster Holcomb. And, uh, Foster and yeah. I'm Bruce oh, and this is I'm Josh. 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 Okay, so uh, we'd like to incorporate to incorporate a little bit of something to do with wood yeah. for this demonstration. So you want to tell us what we got going here, Josh? So actually, we have this nice woodworked lamp. We're going to be making a lampshade for you folks today. So, okay. And then we also have a. One we did a little earlier this week, we had one of our old, you know, woodwork bases that needed just a new lampshade. So, figure why not? This is a perfect time to show you folks. Okay. Yeah, All righty. So that's it, a lampshade for a, a wooden lamp. All righty. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Great. If you all have got any questions, uh, ask away. We're looking at the comment section here, so we'll try and, and help you out on that. Incorporating Father's Day ideas. Yeah. Uh, we've got ideas for Father's Day. We've got the uh, what we refer to as the beer beer mugs. This is our traditional one. This is the one with stout. Oh, with a stout. Yeah. Yes, all course. right. And then this is for St. Patty's Day for you Irish. Okay. For you Irish folks <laughs> I think the there. Irish boys will go for the stout. <laughs> well, that too. I think. Yeah, I one think or the other. The, the Guinness fans. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool. And then. And it looks like somebody knocked a, a golf ball into the glass. A huh? Of yeah. Balls and golf balls and uh, hammer. Yep. Okay. Cool. Very cool. So yeah. So this is the lamp that we're going to be making a wood or glass shade for. So this was actually a lamp. We're not actually sure who made it. This is one of our friends, Susan. She found this lamp. And uh, it just really needs a nice glass shade. So we're going to be making just a nice, kind of a globe-like shade for this piece. OK, very cool. Yeah. Um, what will you do? Will you have any requirements as far as measurements, calibration, that sort of thing to fit the lamp? Um, just, uh, just like. When we're looking at it, we've got to make sure it can fit over the heart, so we can't have too steep of an angle. We want it to kind of come out, have a nice curve. For this lamp, just aesthetically, we want it to kind of come down past where this little arm is, so it's down below the wood, so it kind of just all flows together. But other than that, no, it's pretty much artist choice. Okay. All right, that's pretty cool because uh, while Josh is getting set up, We'll take a quick look. You want to grab the uh, two, the, like the hurricane shade that we made for somebody's lamp, the gold one, the one that uh, we just did a couple weeks ago, where we had to take all the measurements, or is that already gone? Oh, oh I think that's gone. that went. That went out. That went out. Yeah, okay. That went There's out. a lot of times when uh, we're doing work, say for custom shades for people that there's an awful lot of measurements that have to be taken. We have to worry about the diameter of the shade at several points along its construction. We might have to check some internal diameters. So what Josh is able to do now with the calipers is kind of gauge what kind of diameter he wants on this piece of glass and uh, the shaping of it. So 
he's getting his height and his width there and the uh, at the top it'll be uh, completely solid when we make it not the there won't be any hole drilled in it that'll come later okay yep Back again for the third time from Northern Ireland, Brian of Hartwood Turning. Well, welcome aboard. Glad to have all you folks with us. We really get a kick out of this. Yeah, and if any of you woodworkers out there need some glass shades, we're always happy to do custom orders and uh, you know work with you to make some really nice glass pieces. You know to go with your wood. Okay, very good. All righty. Well, let's let's walk on down here and see what's going on. So I realize that some of you may be joining us for the first time so just give you a little idea of the layout in the studio uh, in the glass blowing business we work at a bench there's the bench josh will be working from over there and we make a lot of trips back and forth to a unit called a glory hole which is a basically a reheating oven that's a chamber that is made of uh, basically ceramic like tubes it's a castable material it'll withstand heat up to about 2600 2800 degrees we run it at about 2300 degrees and of course i'm always speaking in fahrenheit here in the u.s but somebody could do a conversion for us uh, anyway that's uh, simply a reheating oven josh is pre-warming the pipe he needs to do that so that the glass will stick to it and right now he's picking up a little bit of glass it's some solid color and he's going to bring that over and warm it. What have you got there? A gold? Yep, it's called Iris Opal Gold. Okay. So it's an opaque gold color. Okay. So that piece of glass that Josh picked up on the end of the pipe has been preheated to about 900 degrees Fahrenheit, and that's so it will stick to the preheated pipe. And now what he'll have to do is melt that. He'll need to get the temperature of that little piece of glass up to about, uh, oh, I, I would guess probably at least uh, 2,000 degrees in order for it to really get a little bit soupy. At 1,900, it'll be uh, moving a little bit. Okay. So something interesting happened. Ah, we got a crack. So when we get this glass from the manufacturer, it comes in this it's in a, a cylindrical form but sometimes there might be a little bit of an air bubble trapped inside and so what happened there was the glass split apart now josh has spread that crack even further because he doesn't want to have that stay in there or just kind of close up around it if he closes up around it and leaves the air inside he'll have a gap in the color when he's done with the lamp so what he needs to do is make sure that that's all fully melted together. So uh, that's that's why the, the crack has to be taken care of. We don't want to be trapping air. And if we do that occasionally, every once in a while, we finish our piece up and in the walls of the piece, there's a little clear spot where there was an air bubble and no color. So what he'll do now is spread it a little bit more and give this all an opportunity to melt back together. Nah, yeah. can, this is a fairly stiff color. So we, we get our glass in this form. We buy it in uh, bars that weigh about, uh, oh, a kilogram each, or maybe uh, two kilograms sometimes and we can chop off just a little piece of that glass and use it. So it doesn't take a great deal of the glass to make a piece, but we'll buy bar stock is what we call it. The other form that we get it in is frit, which is what you see over here on the metal table. Now the metal table is called a marver, and we use that for shaping the glass, cooling the glass. It's kind of a multi-purpose tool. And you can see that we've got two shades of frit on here. And so we've got one that is a uh, aquamarine color, and the other one is cobalt blue. So those will both be incorporated into the lampshade. The colors are made when metal oxides are added to the glass. So over in Germany and uh, 
up until fairly recently in New Zealand, there were glass manufact color manufacturers who would melt several tanks full of color glass, a different color in each one. Uh, we have a single furnace here. We'll show you that in just a moment. But if we were to melt color in it, then we'd be pretty much stuck with that one color till we used up all the glass. Our furnace holds about 450 pounds of glass. Uh, the commercial ones, well, they'll hold well above a thousand pounds. And so they're operating just to, uh, for the market. They're, they're making color for all the glass blowers around the world. Josh just blew a little uh, air into the pipe, trapped it with his finger, and that's caused a small air bubble to come out on the inside of the color. So that is intentional because the lampshade will be a hollow form. So the bubble he forced out from the inside of the piece is intentional. The ones that were within the color, we got rid of. He's into the furnace now, gathering some clear glass over that gold color, and you can kind of see the outline of it. So at this stage, the glass is very fluid. Were he to stop turning, it would actually fall toward the floor. So keeping the glass under control and equally distributed around the pipe is really an important skill. Right now he's using a cherry wood block is the name of the tool. It's basically a cup that's cut out of green wood and it's always kept in water. So we don't want them cracking, we want them to hold their shape. And the thing about the water is we want a bed of steam. The bed of steam that that rolls on forms a little bit of a lubricant and that lets the glass flow nice and easy along the tool. It also helps uh, with the water. We keep the life of the tool. We can get uh, a couple years usage out of one of these blocks without any difficulty. It also gets the shape established. You can see kind of a uh, bulbous end on it, uh, kind of like a Q-tip. And this is important to keep the shape under control. By keeping the shape under control, the blowout is proportional. So Josh is going to put a little more air in this now. We'll step back and see. He blows gently, covers the mouthpiece with his finger, and then the air comes out into the glass and expands. And because it was first in the gold color glass, then uh, we buy our block. Somebody did have a, uh, a question there. I'm sorry, I almost missed it. Okay, yeah, we purchase our blocks from someone that uh, here in the U.S. makes blocks for lots of people. And we not only have the blocks, we have several other wooden tools, and we'll show you some of them as we go along, because I know we got a lot of woodworkers out there to be interested in that. Yeah, so uh, the blocks that Bruce is talking about that we use on a daily basis are, uh, are from the fruitwood family because of the fibrous structure of the fruitwood family. And these pieces of wood are turned, uh, they're, they're green pieces. Uh, they're not allowed to dry out because then the wood would crack. And besides, when we keep them in water, they hold the moisture that when it comes into contact with the glass, it generates a layer of steam for the glass to ride against. And that's one of the main ideas is to get a skin on the glass so that the bubble will blow evenly distributed into the glass on the end of the pipe. Okay, cool. So Josh has let that glass cool off. He's getting ready for another gather of clear glass on the top there. He had to wait a little while because if he had gathered immediately while the core of the glass on the pipe was still hot, it could have all collapsed. The excessive heat of the furnace would have made the bubble in the center collapse. He's using a pipe cooler right now, and it's simply a little trough of water. The irons don't get excessively hot, but it's a good idea to keep the forward part of the iron cool. Notice how far he's able to put his hand up on the pipe. This gives him a lot better leverage, and the leverage is very important because uh, 
if you're even if you're only holding two or three pounds of glass if it's extended about four or five feet from your body it makes the apparent feel of it uh, a lot greater okay so now he's using a larger block getting it shaped as Foster said putting the skin on the glass and that helps the shape of that is really important the length and the diameter. If we get the length and diameter out of proportion, we have difficulty blowing this out evenly if the glass is either too long or too short, if you will. And this is a good proportion right here, a good mix to keep the length and the diameter in that ratio. The glass will blow out evenly and under control. So notice he's waited quite a while, let it cool some, it doesn't take a great deal of heat, of, of air, and you can see that bubble expanding slowly. So a lot of times we wait, and we don't want it to all happen super fast. It's got to be under control. We've got a yard arm here that uh, when we decide to take a short break, we can hang it up. <laughs> no, he's not taking right, a I'll short break I'll right now. Oh, okay, we'll see. Oh, who's taking over for you? <laughs> Actually, he's going to get a glove right now and uh, a little tool that he'll use to do some raking. And uh, we'll explain that. So in a few moments, he's going to be picking up the frit, the granular glass that you see on the barber. And then what he'll do is come back over to the bench with a hot glass. He'll put a glove on his hand because his hand will get close to the glass and he's going to use this metal tool which we form and has a hook on the end of it. He'll let that hook grab the glass and then rake it or pull it and probably just toward the pipe. So you can see here's his third gather of glass and uh, this, is a, this is a good size hunk of glass. He's got a lot of glass on the end and he's letting some of it strip off because of the fluid nature. If he's got more than he needs, he can let it fall off like that. Foster will be tossing that back into the furnace so it can be used. And then as Josh gets his gathers together, he'll begin picking up the frit. We like to keep the gathering under control. We don't want to ever get more than we can handle. You'll notice that with everything he did there, and he's gonna save another little piece of that, everything's under complete control, always rotating the iron to keep the glass symmetrically distributed around the pipe. He can use uh, the metal tool here. This is, these are called jacks, two metal blades, hinged together and now he's going to start picking up the frit. So he's going to get a little more heat in it so it'll adhere a little bit better. And one of the things you'll be able to notice is the angle that he holds the pipe or iron. If his hands are down low and the glass is pointed upward, he'll probably be gathering that cobalt blue frit that is close to the end of the marble. See how that angle facilitates getting the coverage right there. When he wants to gather up the aquamarine glass, he'll bring the iron back over and invert that angle somewhat, or perhaps just start out level and gather the aquamarine. Now he's level, and you'll see that the aquamarine line is past the cobalt blue. So he's got the two lines of color on there, at this point separated. Constant reheating is required because once the glass starts to lose temperature, we can't manipulate it. And in the case of picking up these frits, it will not effectively pick up the frit color. So again, he's got the dark blue and the aquamarine color. And it looks like we've got about 40 of you with us so far, so that's pretty cool. I'm hoping that uh, everybody that had been in on the 
regular link uh, notification to join us on our Facebook page. I'm sorry, our YouTube channel. Here we go again with the uh, Cobalt Blue and the Aquamarine. We can use the marver to shape the glass. Notice the inclined angle gave it a little more rounded area toward the end, toward the tip of it. And since I mistakenly said something about Facebook, if you are interested in watching more of the glass blowing, I know we've got, uh, let's see, we've got Tommy, we've got Steve, we've got several other of the uh, UK woodworkers that have been joining us on Tuesdays. And uh, on Tuesdays here on the East Coast of the US, we do a Facebook Live presentation, usually about two hours, and uh, make all kinds of different pieces and explain what's going on. And the time for that would be 11 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time here in the U.S. And I know that we are four hours behind Greenwich Mean Time. So, all right, now Josh is over picking up a little band of white, I believe. Yeah, he's got a little bit of white powder there, and he's putting that on the bottom. We going for an oceanic theme, a water theme? A water theme. A water theme, okay. So one of the broadcasts we did a few weeks ago, we, uh, oh yeah, he does have the baking soda. So you can see this little one here is labeled baking soda. So the baking soda is going to force some bubbles to form in the glass. So the baking soda will off gas under the white and we'll have some bubbles appear there. So when we get this all done, the lampshade is going to remind us, we hope, of, of an ocean wave. There'll be the deep blue in the lowest portions, and then it'll lighten up into the aquamarine, and then the top of it will have the gold backing up the white, and there'll be some bubbles like sea foam. We can see a few of the bubbles forming up there underneath. So what happened was the baking soda was what he went through first and then as it's heated and has the white on top of it, the bubbles push up through the white. He's got his glove on now and he's got that hooking tool. So he'll come back to his bench after a reheat and begin to rake the glass break the colors one through another. While he's reheating, we'll take a quick look at the furnace. This is our furnace, which runs all the time, 365 days a year, all day, all night, unless we have to take it down for repair, and that doesn't happen real often. That's the only unit in the facility that stays on all the time. The glory holes, the annealers, the other appliances we use as needed. So now he's going to rake the blue up toward the white. And he'll do this in a couple of places. You'll also notice that as he does this, he's fighting gravity. Notice how the iron is held at a downward angle this controls the fall of the glass toward the floor. And now he's taking that hook and moving it to the side a little bit and giving you the look of an ocean wave cresting. So he'll do a couple more of those. And uh, so you'll, when we get the finished product out and have pictures online, you'll be able to see how that design works out. He's got that heated up again. You can tell by the orange glow, the incandescence, that the heat's up in there. And right now he's just getting the final curve on those first two that he dragged down. No 
Okay. Well, lots of times we put multiple curls in these, but I'll ask, is that it, Josh? Just no, two? We'll do four. He'll do four. Okay. So now you'll get to watch it done again. Move the camera in and out a little bit so you can see the motions. But what's really interesting is the way he manipulates the pipe as he's doing this. When he first comes to the bench, he'll let the glass sag toward the floor on the side he intends to utilize. It sags toward the floor, then he flips it so he can pull on it while it's falling again. So he's balancing this constant falling with his pull. You can also see that it's pulling the glass away from the pipe a little bit. Another reason to hold the pipe with the handle in pointed downward so that we don't have gravity pulling the glass away from the pipe too. That elongation that he had there was caused by the pulling action of the hooking tool. If he had tried holding the iron downward or had accidentally pointed it down that way, it would have gotten even longer and further away from the blowing iron. So once again, he's driving heat into it in the glory hole. He'll bring it back to the bench and probably finish up the hooking just as he did before with a little bit of curvature. So he reaches into that straight line and curls it around, making a bit of a comma out of it, if you will. Now, once he's done with all of that, he'll take his glove off, Foster will turn the pipe while he gets uh, his, his equipment change here. That distorted the shape a little bit. Not only did it make it a little longer, it put some indentations into the glass. And what he'll work on is also smoothing those out so he's got a pristine surface to work on as he then blows out. So this is the finish of the decorative aspect of it. And in a lot of the pieces we make, that takes quite a little while. Once we get all the decorative aspects of it, then we can go about the construction process. So now he's back at the barber. You can see from the angle of the iron, he made contact with the glass that was closest to the pipe. Now that he's inverted the angle, the other end of the glass makes contact. So in addition to constantly turning, like you folks do on a lathe, he's constantly changing the angle of the material so that it encounters the surface differently. So here's your design elements. You're beginning to see them in take place right now. You'll put a little more air in it. There's another piece of equipment we have over here up between the glory hole in the furnace. This is a pipe warmer and this is where we warm things, uh, the pipes up before we start picking up glass on them. Uh, cold pipes, the glass does not adhere as well, adhere as well to and also uh, the cold pipe could actually start chilling the glass that's closest to it. So by preheating the iron, whether we intend to gather or pick up a small piece of color, it's an essential step. He's using the jacks now, and he's cutting what we call a jack line, amazingly enough, or a neck line. This is where he will separate the piece from the blowpipe later on. Right now, he's free blowing, okay? He hasn't done too much of that. He's simply blowing directly into the pipe and increasing the diameter of the glass. Most of the shapes we make start off as a sphere with a jack line in it. And then we'll use gravity or centrifugal force. Okay, Vicki Jenkinson, I hope that covered it for you. She asked if she could uh, get the camera on Josh actually blowing.
A lot of people will ask about the uh, amount of force that's required when we blow the glass. When the glass is hot, it's not a great deal. It's, it's not nearly what blowing into a musical instrument would be. Uh, the glass inflates pretty easily when it's hot. So Josh is going to blow it out a little bit more now. And he's increasing the size of that sphere. And now he's hooking up what's called a blow hose. Remarkably enough, it's a hose we blow through. The advantage of this is he can use a hand tool, as he is right now with the newspaper, and blow at the same time and see the work change in front of his eyes. If he didn't have the blow, have the blow hose, he'd have to move the iron away from him to get to the mouthpiece, and his work would be about three and a half feet away instead of being right in front of him. So now you can see the bull blue pulled up through the green and into the white. And he's getting quite a large sphere here. He doesn't have his finished length set yet, so we blow a little bit larger than our finished diameter so that when we do lengthen the glass, either through centrifugal force or just hanging it down and letting gravity lengthen it, the diameter will decrease and we don't want to go below our finished product. He's using newspaper right now to chill the bottom. That's approximately seven or eight sheets of newsprint, just like your regular daily paper, folded into a small square, in this case about seven inches by eight inches and always kept wet and it's a perfect insulator now to me this is looking a little bit like the earth and the depiction of, of storms from the from a spacecraft now there's his calipers for the link would you just Man. hold that real quick again who made it this big okay yeah you that's who <laughs> so there's there's the di that's the link he has to go to but he wants this sphere large enough that when he swings it out and lets it elongate under control that it is still the diameter he needs. If he were to hang this straight down while it's hot, it would get longer and we could see it get longer. But that length comes at the expense of the diameter. So that's why we start out with a bit more diameter than we need. Notice he held that down at about a 45 degree angle and he's still holding it down somewhat. He's letting it lengthen slowly and under control. Now in this particular case, because it's a lampshade, the portion of the glass that is away from the pipe, the outboard portion, is actually going to be the top of the lampshade. Normally we would have the bottom of the vessel there if we were making a drinking glass or a pitcher or a bowl. But in this case, because the piece will be turned essentially upside down when it's mounted on the lamp, we have the top of the vessel furthest away from us. So that will be a slightly smaller diameter than the opening that he ends up with. He's still working on getting the length to what he wants and keeping diameter. This will be a really gradual process. He'll keep this completely under control and swing gently. And then if he wants, he can swing a little more forcefully or make the full 360. And now you're starting to see a bit of the lampshade shape and can recognize that up here in the gold portion, this will be the top of the lampshade and then right below it will be the waves and the white foam leading all the way down to the blue ocean at the bottom which will be the lower rim of the lamp shape. So we've got a little bit more shaping to do here. Now if this were a, a vessel, say a drinking glass or a bowl, we would flatten the bottom so it would sit upright on a table. But since we're going to put this onto a wooden lamp, we're going to leave the end of it rounded 
we'll attach a piece of uh, glass with a pipe to the end of that and transfer it without being flattened. So you can see the centrifugal force is elongating the glass by carefully gauging the length. He can add a little bit of air there if he needs it, if the diameter drops. And now he's hooking up the blow hose again. So he'll probably be using the newspaper to control. The, the newspaper will do a couple things. It will cool the glass, which will keep it from inflating at that point. But it can also shape the glass. So instead of having to use the metal jack blades or the metal marvering table, he can actually use the newspaper to shape the glass. So keep a close eye on the shape of the glass as he grabs the paper. It's cooling it at the bottom, keeping it from inflating too much. It's getting kind of this nice egg shape on it. As he told you when we uh, first started, he doesn't want this to get too narrow and not be able to clear the lamp's part. So that's why he needs a gradual curve down there at the top of the piece. And he's got his uh, calipers on there to set it. After the piece is fully annealed and done, there we go with the calipers. When the piece is fully done and annealed, they'll actually drill a hole in the top of it to fit onto the lamp. So now what will happen is the transfer. Foster is gathering some glass on the end of a solid iron. This will act like a little bit of glue, if you will. And he's going to get a good sized chunk of glass because this, uh, this lampshade is fairly heavy and it will want to move and break off. So Foster will form this in to a little bit of, of a shape here. Very little glass hanging off the end. we we'll make it rounded, get it shaped up, and Josh in the background over there will occasionally reheat the piece. Very important to keep this glass above a thousand degrees Fahrenheit or it could crack while you're in the construction process. Foster shaping up the putty, and once he has that done, then he'll be bringing it to Josh to attach to the bottom. This process is what we call a transfer. We're going to transfer from the blowing iron to the punty iron so we can finish the rest of the piece. So Josh is going to place the punty in the center of the bottom, and what we could look at is the rotation of both irons. There's about uh, nine or ten feet of steel there that's moving back and forth with the glass ball in the middle. It's all got to be in a nice straight line. We want it centered so that when we're opening the bowl, it's not turning on an eccentric. It's not off-center. Josh is cutting a small indentation in the punty glass right there. He's going to let this cool a lot. When we do take it off of the putty, that little bit of glass will be left on the top of the lamp, but when we drill the hole out, it will disappear. A little bit of water on the neckline, a tap of the iron, and it comes right off. So now we've got the transfer accomplished. That's usually the breath holding moment in the glass blowing process. And Foster's opening another door there. So we've got this glory hole wide open. This is as much room as we can get. That's also the limiting factor in the diameter of the piece. Now the comments are coming up and disappearing a little, little at a time, but I saw one from someone as Gerard the French Turner. Would you mind telling us where in France you are, Gerard? Josh has to heat the entire vessel here to keep it from cracking, but he's going to concentrate the heat on the opening at the far end. That's where he'll be working.
that glass was cold enough to fracture, it's going to take a little while to get it. Uh... Oh, okay. French chef from Bordeaux, living in Ireland since 1981. Very good. Thank you. Uh, we're, we're always amazed when we get in on this virtual craft festival and how worldwide the participation is. You can see him moving the piece back and forth within the glory hole. And we can look at the color here of the heat. The opening of the piece is the hottest part right now. Josh is using the jacks to open that up a little bit. We'll come around here to get a better view. Increase the diameter of that to about, oh, two and a half inches or so. That's going to be what gets opened up wide for the lowest part of the vessel. Uh, somebody commented a minute ago they'd be afraid of it falling off the pipe. If the punting got too cold, that could absolutely happen. So that's why we're very cautious about doing what we call flash heats. A flash heat is just a brief introduction of heat, and you can tell those when he goes in just a little deeper with the glass, and then he pulls back some to concentrate most of the heat right on that opening and the lower two or three inches. He'll take a really good flash in there before he comes back to the bench. That's to ensure that the punty stays hot the entire time he's at the bench. So now he's going to use the newspaper to straighten and stabilize the side a little bit. He'll change over to the jacks and begin to open. Foster flattens the lip with one paddle and shields Josh's forearm with the other. Now you can really see the green showing up and the white and the gold up there. That glass is cooling off. It's still well above a thousand degrees. It's probably up in the range of 14 to 1500 degrees Fahrenheit, but it's a little cooler, so you're starting to see the colors appear. The heat, or the orange glow, will be primarily in the lower half of the vessel. So what you're looking at right now the punty is attached to the top of the lampshade. After the piece is annealed, a hole will be drilled through that location to allow it rest on the lamp. What Josh is working on now is getting the lower portion, the diameter, increased. Now, if he turns fast, the glass will start spinning out. Foster is using a pair of wooden jacks, also called perchofi, and he's using that to open. The wooden jacks steal less heat from the glass, and they scar the glass less. The metal tools can scar the glass a little bit. You're really getting a good view of the colors there now. And you'll notice, I didn't time it, but my guess is gonna be he had less than one minute back there at the bench before it was time to go reheat. Now he and Foster are discussing the finished shape and what they're going to do to get there. So this is all going to happen very quickly. Again, the heat's being concentrated at the opening, the part that's furthest away from the punty iron. That will be the bottom of the lampshade. That is going to open significantly. You can see the heat in there. The blue, the dark blue color is a glowing orange right now. Josh uses the newspaper to hold the shape at the higher portion. Foster uses the parchofi or wooden jacks to open it up some more. If Josh didn't have the newspaper on there, the middle portion of that would bulge out from centrifugal force. And every once in a while they'll give a gander 
at the lamp, which is sitting down there at the other end of the studio on the uh, Marver down there, just to make sure what they want as far as the flow of this form. So they'll be discussing constantly what it is that's coming up next. The two of them are deciding how they're going to do this, who needs to use switch tools. Foster has the part trophies in hand. We'll see Josh keep the glass under control with the newspaper. And Foster will open this up more by using the wooden jacks and kind of lifting up as Josh turns the iron. He's increasing the diameter of the opening down there. If it goes out of round, we just keep it turning and put the tools back in there. Okay, so we're getting larger on it now. Will the finish line be a straight line or will it be ruffled? No, it'd be uh, no, a straight line. Straight, but straight ta line. Ta tapered in just a bit. Okay. So sometimes when we make these, we can put ruffles on the end of it simply by spinning it out and then lowering it toward the floor. But as you heard, they're going to keep a straight line with a bit of a taper going down toward the bottom. So. This is pretty much the shape you're going to see for the shade. And that actually makes a lot of sense because if we had a ruffle in the bottom of the ocean, we wouldn't really be able to see it. So now you can see the depth of the water, the green as it comes up in the waveform, the crest that's curled over, and the white foam. Beautiful. Now after they're certain that they've got the amount of heat in this that they want and any final adjustments, they'll take it off of the punty iron and put it onto or into a pair of insulated gloves and then into the annealer. And we'll explain that in just a moment. So now the colors are much more apparent. The temperature of the glass is dropping. It's no longer up in the 2,000 degree range. We're getting down to the point where we're probably around 1,500. Fat Foster has on the insulated gloves. Josh will put a drip of water onto the joint where he made that crease in the punty. Then he will tap the iron and the lampshade will break free. There it goes. Josh will open the annealer doors. And Foster puts it into the annealer. All right, let's hear it for Josh and Foster. Give us some of that thumbs up and love and all the other stuff that you do when you're on social media. Yes, thank you. We think it is beautiful. Okay. Huh? Yeah, that came, came out really, really well. Beautiful peach, beautiful work. Okay. Any questions from any folks? Let us know. If you've got questions, let us know. Uh, this brick box back here is an annealer. And an annealing process simply lets the glass cool at a slow rate. We run that at about 900 degrees Fahrenheit. And... Uh, it stays at that all day. When the piece went away, it's in the vicinity of, let's say, 14 to 1500 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's okay for the glass to move from that temperature down to 900. And it, it might do that in the course of 30 minutes or so. But with this glass, which is soda lime glass, that's what it's called, and that's the most common glass used in this world, uh, there's a critical temperature range. Uh, when you come down from 900 until you pass through about 750 degrees, you're in an area where the glass can crack if it cools off too quickly. The molecular structure of the glass is really kind of jumbled. It's not a nice crystal like quartz would be. So 
in order to relieve the internal stresses in the glass, we let the temperature come down slowly. And just as you may have a brick patio or driveway around your home, if you've experienced in the summer, it's still hot in the evening, well, these bricks will slowly release their heat overnight until the glass is down to the temperature of the room and we can take it out. How do you see any patterns when the glass is red hot? A lot of the coloration we don't see at that point. Uh, we can see any design elements that might have been ridges or swirls or creases or anything like that. They're not going to disappear if we do it right. But when it's red hot, that glow is from the metal oxides in the glass, the electrons getting all excited and running around fast. So that's, uh, if you got any other questions, fire them out there. We, we've got another couple of minutes. What you gonna do for us? Do a bubble and just get a blow bubble. Oh, okay. So Josh is gonna gather some glass and just show you what we can do as far as how large of a bubble you can make. So Yeah, and also kind of show you really how much control goes into handling the glass. You know, if we let the glass do what it wants to do, it's really gonna... It's gonna be a mess. <laughs> he can blow this bigger than a beach ball. Oh, way bigger. But way bigger. Yeah. Probably bigger than any fruit you've seen. <laughs> So, we talked about keeping it under control and with the heat. And he's cooling the side of it a little bit. You can see how much it's moving just from the residual heat. And he's cooled it a good bit on the Marver. If he had come straight out of the furnace and started blowing, it would have been completely out of control. He's capped the end of the blowpipe with his finger again. He's going to get the bubble to start out. You might be able to see it forming now. And there we go. Now that would not be a bad size if yeah. we were making a scotch glass. However, we can do more than that. And we can keep blowing. Oh yes, please. More. More. Keep it going. Ah, oh, come on. You got more than that. Now at some point, the glass will not even support its own weight. And the shape changes. It's no longer under control as far as shape goes. All right, so I got it. And it will pop. There we go. <laughs> so this is what happens with uncontrolled glass blowing. So now you can appreciate the time that he spent letting the glass cool off some before he blew into it. And now, because of its thinness, he's able to pick it up, whereas just moments ago it was 2,000 degrees. And it's very flexible. He can bend it and snap it. Oh, here's a good one. That's a perfect example. Glass blower's gone wild. <laughs> okay. So that's, uh, now, in the piece he was making, he could have come nowhere close to touching that. We couldn't touch that right now without burning ourselves severely. But when the glass is that thin and it loses its heat, it's back to room temperature. Yep, it really is quite interesting. Yeah, no, I just love the, you know, that's glass. And it's still that flexible. That's still the same material See that if I can it, touch it up. See how it's, whoops. It's that. <laughs> but you can see that there's the, the... Why does it bend? It bends because it's so thin and the material will allow it. Okay? If the material were twice that thick, it would not bend. And fiber optics, right? Yeah, fiber optics, same type of thing. So fiber optics glass is probably a different formulation, maybe? Just a slight different formulation, but it's okay. still, still glass. Okay, yeah. yeah, it is still glass. There are over a thousand formulas of glass. So Foster has a small string of glass right here, and you can see that that's just a little piece, a little thread that came off uh, probably when we gathered or off the end of the furnace, okay? Yeah. So it is, uh, it is flexible at a certain point, but we try not to get it there. Now when we're teaching classes, quite often we see that with our students and it's time to start over. If you've got any more questions, yeah. let them rip. We got another couple of minutes here. Okay. And this will get recycled and just thrown right back into the furnace. Okay.
Okay, well, thank you all for joining us. Uh, again, this is the Art of Fire Glass Blowing Studio. And if you'd like to join us on Tuesday, we have a Facebook Live presentation that goes off at uh, 11 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time. I know we're four hours behind uh, Universal Coordinated Time or Greenwich Mean Time, if you will. So wherever you are in the world, if you'd like to watch, we do about a two-hour show and do all kinds of different glass blowing and other stupid tricks. So, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much. You take care. Have a good spring. We'll see you next month. Okay. Yeah, thank you, folks. Thank you all. All right. Bye-bye. Well, I'm trying to hang up. <laughs> yes.